The Art of Getting Lost for George Sibley. Imagine a hitchhiker on the road to Cresta Butte, long hair, backpack. Suddenly, a Winnebago pulls up with Texas plates and a tint tinted window rolls down. Excuse me, Pilgrim. Can you show me the way to the nearest wilderness mall parking lot? <laughs> and our hippie says, hey, man, get lost. But I say, before you lose it, look closely, because it's not so much you losing it as place that takes you away. It's slick rock deer trail thick with juniper takes you away. It's make a shale, wild strawberry, avalanche shoot, takes you away. And suddenly, hola cala, panto rey, you're just another neo-pagan Zen mother budada, learning pandemonium, toking pure chaos. <laughs> Cougar in the headlights, takes you away. Hair streak in the rabbit brush takes you away. Or maybe it's at a table over breakfast where some resort town waitron Venus collie clone takes you away. And falling in love, you lose it. Take Luna in the mushrooms and quack grass rolling in it that first green eyed summer. Or take that infamous hike we took to the San Miguel Canyon petroglyph that scribed a hoop in the earth and led us back to our beginnings. Remember, you can't lose what you haven't found. Crouching for shelter from Shandoka's lightning and ice, clamoring hands and knees up lone cone scree, one minute next to death, and then born again and again and again, Canyonland cliff shelf narrowing to goat hold. Uncum Pagres, Tabawatch Pine, scratched by bear. Getting so lost, you find yourself. Toad Kachino Grotto Vision on Nuvati Yaovi, the San Francisco Peaks, takes you away. Big Sur, hot spring, crotch of a redwood, full moon pull, takes you away. Pacific Rim Comers in a salt point storm, slamming down fists, takes you away. Letting go enough not to panic, but to play it like a tune, whistled and hummed as a hymn to the mother. Easy, bro. Aliakala's charm takes you away. Yo, eating mangoes and making love in the sea cave at Kalalao takes you away. This is my religion. I believe in being lost. And everything I find along the way is tamalagro. And what finds me, I try to field. Thinking adventure, not predicament. Chasing chaos just as much as calm. The only straight lines in the headwaters are the rifle's scope, the map's compass. So, scram, pathfinders, surveyors, engineers, give me the loons, zigzag walk. Let me lose it. I know how to use it. Good evening, everyone. Sorry, I was supposed to sprint down those stairs and not be here. So, Micah, thank you so much. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Nancy Chisholm. I am the interim president here at Western, uh, which is a tremendous honor for me in so many ways because I'm an alum 
I graduated from Western many, many years ago. Whenever I meet with our students, I'm painfully reminded of how long ago it was. Uh, Micah reached out to me, gosh, Mike, I think in, in August to ask if I would, you know, just address the group here. And I said, it would be such an honor to be able to do this. Welcome. Welcome to all of you to tonight and to this weekend, which just should be a, a tremendous event, the 32nd uh, convocation of this, uh, this environmental and sustainability group. It's so wonderful to be a part of this. I, I was so happy to see that we could do some of this in person and some of this online. We did a tremendous job at Western this last year, keeping everybody safe, and we continue to do that. But having people here in person, there's really no trade-off for this. So it's so wonderful to see the members of our community here. And thank you for being here and being a part of this. Not long, I came up here um, June 1st to be the interim president at Western. And one of the things I was able to do at that time was to welcome Butch Clark and the convocation of his School of Environmental and Sustainability, which was such an honor for me to be a part of. So it's so wonderful to have all of you here tonight and we're so happy to have you. I've enjoyed so much getting to know you, Butch, and so happy to see you here this evening. Um, and I just think this is like a wonderful event to have the entire community here and be a part of this. So thank you. I look forward to this evening and this weekend, which should just be tremendous for the institution and to talk about the role that Western plays today and can play in the future as we all think about sustainability and our environment and the role that we all play. It's an, an honor for me to be in this interim role and to think about this and, and play a leadership role. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening and I really look forward to this weekend. So thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Melanie Armstrong, and I am the interim dean of the Clark School of Environment and Sustainability. Apparently, we, we like transitions here at Western. We have a lot of interim going on right now, which is appropriate for a headwaters, right? A place of transition, a place of movement, a place of beginning. So it's really a pleasure to be here and to welcome you. This may be the 32nd Headwaters Conference, but it is the first Headwaters Conference hosted by the Clark Family School of Environment and Sustainability. Thank you, Butch. I feel like that's the greatest pleasure that I get to say this evening, but I'll share a couple other thoughts with you because I've also had the privilege, it was my second year here at Western when uh, someone handed me a gourd, right? Our good times handed me a gourd and said that I would be directing the Headwaters Conference the next year. And, uh, and boy, did I not know what I was in for. <laughs> and I remember very distinctly those moments when uh, Alan Mortez and Art Good Times came out on stage and opened with poetry and song. And I realized that this wasn't a conference the way I had come to think of conferences in my academic world. And what a wonderful introduction to, to Western, to Gunnison, to this valley, to think of conferences of as a place of gathering, a place where the community comes together with this amazing community of students and our faculty and so many people who just work to engage in the sharing of ideas. We had the privilege this week of hosting a group of young men from Zuni Pueblo who worked with the Ancestral Lands Conservation Corps on our campus. And during their visit, they talked frequently of elders and we use that term in the Headwaters Conference as well, referring to the elders of our conference. And really when I think about that, I think of the school of thought and the ideas that have been passed on um, and, and the role that elders play in sharing knowledge and ideas. And I think a little bit of inspiration as well. And so when I hear arts poetry and I think about the art of getting lost, I can't help but think of the wisdom that he passes on to all of us through his work and through his art. I, I 
really deeply regret that Alan Mortez um, is unable to join us tonight. If I if I think of it at the end, I will try to play his Headwaters anthem um, as you leave, so you can hear that that music that he wrote in tribute to what it means to live in Gunnison Valley. And I think all of you will be able to relate to the the feeling of your car not starting in the morning, and that's something that you both want to sing about and bang your head up up against the steering column over. And that that is the spirit that art or that Alan brings through his anthem and the recognition that living in the headwaters can be a trying thing. It can be a hard place to live, but that is also what makes us who we are. George Sibley, another founder, another elder of Headwaters is here. And I remember George talking about Headwaters as a place of art and a place of community, but also a vague idea and a romantic vision. And I love thinking about that and what it means to to have a vision and bring it about. And I think a tradition that goes on for 30 years is about that vision as well. And I look at so many of our students who are sitting in the audience today and so many, I'm sure, of our alumni who are out there in the virtual world. I don't know where the cameras are right now, but I know that, that you all carry something from these headwaters with you, wherever you are in your careers, whatever you are doing with your family and loved ones, in whatever places you are choosing to plant yourselves, whether that's near or far from here. And that's, that's what this conference provides. It provides a moment for us to come together and then a moment to go out and share what we've experienced here with others. I'd want to close with just a couple of thoughts that those Zuni youth shared with me upon their departure after having spent time on this campus learning with all of you in this community, experiencing your restaurants that closed surprisingly early. It was somehow very hard to feed them while they were here, <laughs> but, we had, but we had so many chances to talk with them about what makes place special to them. And one of the things that they, they shared with me was that they, they really valued and they had forgotten in some ways what a privilege it is to learn, what a privilege it is to hear new ideas. And so I hope as you enjoy our presentation this evening and the rest of the conference, that you will think about the, the true privilege that we all have of being in a place like this, where we can learn together, when we, where we can share ideas with each other. And that that's sometimes something we forget right? Whether it's because you're doing exams and so caught up in the drudgery, it seems, of learning that you forget those the sparks and those inspiring moments that actually make the, the learning so exciting. The other thing that they shared with me was the sense after having been on our campus of recognizing that their voices really matter. And I can't thank you enough for being a community that helps people feel like their voices and their ideas are important that their ideas bring something to the table um, from whatever corner of the earth they come from. And because we're, we were talking a little bit about water tonight, I will share that they had the chance to go out to the, uh, the Cold Harbor property and stand along the, the banks of Tomichi Creek and watching all of that water rush by in the headwaters, they reflected on their own river on the Zuni Pueblo, which is very nearly dry and most of the year is dry. And they looked at our water, at our river, with a sense of awe, with a sense that we had something, a great gift here in this valley. And that's something that I don't always remember. That's something that's easy for me to forget. And so I appreciated the way that these young people brought to me a remembrance of what it means to live in the headwaters. So thank you all for being here tonight. I wanna to close with a few lines from another of our headwaters elders. It says, tonight the stars are rubbing themselves against a distant wall of clouds. There is friction in the air, an electricity that promises something loud and memorable. May tonight be loud and memorable for you. Welcome everyone. My name is Micah Russell. I'm your Headwaters Director this year. It's such a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for joining this conversation. It is my privilege to introduce our guest tonight. Conservationist and writer William DeBuise is the author of 10 books. They include The Last Unicorn, a search for one of Earth's rarest creatures, listed by the Christian Science Monitor as one of the 10 best nonfiction books of 2015. 
A Great Aridness, Climate Change and the Future of the American West, winner of the Weber Clements Prize for the best book on the Southwest in 2011. And River of Traps, a 1991 Pulitzer Prize finalist. His most recent book, The Trail to Kanjiroba, Rediscovering Earth in an Age of Loss, appeared in August 2021. He has been a Klug Distinguished Visiting Scholar at the Library of Congress in 2018, a Guggenheim Fellow in 2008 and 2009, a Lindhurst Fellow in 1986 through 1998, 1988. He was the founding chair of the Vals Caldera Trust, responsible for administering the 89,000 acre Vals Caldera National Preserve in Northern New Mexico between 2001 and 2004. He lives on the farm he has tended since 1976 in the remote village of El Val in New Mexico. Everyone, please welcome him, William DeBlees. Thank you so much, Micah. Can you hear me? Is the PA working? Is that, yeah, nodding? Okay, good, good. <clears throat> all right. Well, thank you all for being here. And, and <clears throat> thanks also to people out there in the world joining us by Zoom and in another room and goodness knows where. It's really an honor uh, to be here with you and to participate in this tradition, this terrific tradition. I think I'm gonna take this off. Um, it's a wonderful thing that George Sibley started 32 years ago. And uh, it's... great that it's being maintained in such a good spirit and you know I, I, I get around to a number of universities uh, at least I did before COVID came along and I've got to say the welcome here and the treatment that I've received and my friend Murat whom you'll meet tomorrow when his movie is shown uh, is just second to none. It's been great to be here. I really appreciate it. Um, so thank you. And uh, wow, what a summer we just had, huh? In the course of the summer, we saw an entire Greek island combusted. We saw terrific fires in Turkey and in Italy. We saw the Pacific Northwest, a lot of it go up in smoke again. We saw yet another year, another summer of California flambe. And that was just for starters. We also saw terrific floods in Belgium and in Western Germany. We saw fires in Siberia that were greater than all those other fires put together. And as far as I know, we are still now in hurricane season, which has gone stretched longer and longer year by year. This is the second year running that the National Weather Service has run out of conventional names. We've worked our way all the way through the alphabet. That's only happened three times in history, and two of those are the last two years. So much of what you all are building here at Western is about building a healthier and more sustainable world. And goodness, we need that, because the problems of climate change are really only just getting started. And here's what I want to talk about tonight. How you feel, how we all feel when we see those dire headlines day after day. Here in this valley, the beauty is almost overwhelming. Things are pretty doggone intact. But meanwhile, we read about and we experience the rest of the world, big places sort of falling apart. We feel, for want of a better term, environmental grief. And so I wonder if some of you are like me, I wonder if as hard as you're working at building this better world, 
or training yourself to build this better world that we need, I wonder if you sometimes question whether your efforts will matter in the long run, whether instead they might be canceled by climate change or by some other force you can't control. That kind of thinking gives me the blues a lot. And I want to talk about getting over those blues. I want to talk about looking squarely at the facts of our planetary predicament without flinching, but also without losing heart. I want to talk about how we continue to care for the Earth without becoming demoralized and without giving in to cynicism, despair, or apathy, no matter how bad things get. There's a lot of room for platitudes on this subject, and I'm going to try to stay away from them. The only way I really can address this issue honestly is by talking about my own journey in trying to deal with these emotions. And that journey takes the shape of a trilogy of books, three books that are in spirit connected. But at the outset, I have to tell you that I never intended to write these three connected books. At the beginning, if I'd had that thought, I'd have run away and shaking in fear. It was much too big a project for me to have taken on. But things just sort of turned out that way. And so in the course of those books, I think I learned some useful takeaways. But the first thing I want to say to you is that what works for me might not work for you. The important thing is to take the journey, to jump into the water, to navigate the river of your future with conscious intent, with conscious intent. That's the key. My journey began at a conference much like this one. I was sitting in the back rows kind of daydreaming. All of you looked very alert. I wasn't. <laughs> um, and a scientist put this slide up. Is it going to happen? Maybe it's going to happen. There it is. Did you do that or? I did that, but you should be able to do it. <laughs> okay, good. Anyhow, I woke from my daydream and I looked over there. I looked at my beloved Southwest and I saw it in the alarming, most alarming colors on the map. This map forecasts surface stream flow at mid century i.e. 2050, and what it says, if you interpret it, is that the Southwest, our beloved land, can expect 20% or more decline in surface stream flow. Well, what surface stream flow? That's the renewable water that's available to us. So I looked at that, I kind of woke up, I looked at that and I thought, holy smokes, my land, my homeland is going to change profoundly. And it took a while. I began looking for resources, i.e. money and time. And I was fortunate enough to find enough to let me go and seek out the people who made this map and talk to them and find out how they developed it, how it came to be and what its further implications were. And eventually, that effort turned into this book, one that Micah mentioned a little while ago, which reviewed the, the sort of modeling prophecies of climate change for the Southwest. And you all probably know all these things. This was back in the, I started the project in 2006. This book came out in 2011. And you know the business, it's hot, we're heading into a hotter and drier future. Uh, the new normal will be like the droughts, some of the heaviest droughts of the past. Uh, we're gonna have a lot less surface water, whether or not precipitation declines, 
because hotter times mean more evaporation. If temperature goes up like this, evaporation goes up like this. So the drought stress of a hotter world is much, much greater than what we're used to experiencing here. And on and on, more fires, more this, more that. The warnings were dire and accurate and they held up very, very well, except in one respect. The changes are actually happening faster than the models originally predicted. We're going down that road at pretty good speed. These warnings got a lot of good people working really hard to try to make things better and to avert the catastrophes that were forecast. But a lot of other people haven't done a damn thing. And a lot of them have actively tried to obstruct doing the things that are needed. I don't know about you all, but this makes me pretty mad. The only other data slide I want to show is this one, and I bet a lot of you know what it is. This is the Keeling curve. Charles David Keeling began measuring atmospheric CO2 up on Mauna Loa, a mountain of the Hawaii, Island, Hawaii Islands that's pokes right, right up into the trade winds, some of the best mixed air on the planet. And he developed a contraption that allowed him to measure the CO2. This is where it was when he got started in 1958. This is where it was when LBJ, President Johnson, got the first alert from the National Academies of Science that this business of global warming was gonna be a future threat to the stability of world civilization. We've known that at an official policy level since here. This is about where we were 1989 when Bill McKibben wrote The End of Nature, which was the first popular book uh, directed toward a general audience that went into detail about this phenomenon of global warming. And you know, here at 2005, that's where that map that I just showed you was published. Look where we are now. Look, we're just, this is what I refer to as the suicide note of Western civilization, of industrial civilization. I don't know if I came up with that term or, term or I learned it somewhere else, but, but look at that. This is the Thelma and Louise strategy. <laughs> you just put the pedal to the metal, gun it, and go hell for leather, and who knows if you'll go off a cliff, right? So A Great Aridness was the first book of the trilogy, and I was pretty upset by what I'd learned, but things were so busy I couldn't think about it too much because virtually the day I sent off the manuscript to the publisher, I started packing for a wildlife expedition in Southeast Asia. I was joining a conservation biologist by the name of Bill Robichaud to go into the forest of central Laos and look for uh, a really beautiful animal. Let's see, here's the map to give you an idea where we were. We were actually going into Nakainam Tun National Protected Area there in central Laos. Vietnam is along the coast. Laos is just inside. The Anamite Mountains create the border between the two countries, and that's where we were going into the heights of the Anamites. We were going to look for a really beautiful animal, one of the rarest large animals, large mammals, uh, terrestrial large mammals, excluding now dolphins and whales, but one of the rarest terrestrial large mammals on earth, the Saula. This is a Saula. Her name is Martha. She was br briefly in a little menagerie uh, on a highway in Laos where my friend Bill Robichaud was able to take this picture. The saula is a grazing animal. It's actually a relative of wild cattle, although it looks more like an antelope. Back then at the time of our expedition, there might've been 
a couple of hundred Saula still on Earth. Today, we're probably down to a few dozen at best. In going to seek the Saula, we went deep into the forest. We went beyond the reach of government. One in some of this slide and another one, you'll see some of our guides with AK-47s. It's, it's a, a, a wilderness in the truest sense in that nobody really controls what goes on in this depth of forest. It's also some of the most verdant and productive forest on the planet. Um, and so beautiful, but also so ravaged. We were actually going to the front lines of humankind's war on wildlife. The forest we went into was laced with snare lines, sometimes miles long, along the whole length of a ridge or across a canyon from one ridge to another. These snare lines consisted of chopped hedges of brush, hedges of chopped brush piled up uh, so that animals couldn't get through except where gaps were left in the hedge. And in each gap, there was a snare, a foot snare. These snares were strong enough to capture wild pigs and large species of deer, and they were delicate enough to capture uh, uh, beautiful small birds. In the course of our time there, we encountered this dead ferret badger, for instance. Here a ferret ba badger, there a silver pheasant, maybe the most beautiful bird in the world. Uh, this is a the fawn of a large antlered muntjac, uh, a globally threatened, critically threatened uh, species, endangered species. This one actually went into the stew pot that night. It had been dead only a couple of days. And our head guide, uh, in what, with what I thought was too much optimism, was saying the meat was still good. <laughs> um, the snaring was about supplying the wildlife trade, which provides animals and animal parts for the so-called cures of traditional Chinese medicine. Some animals, their meats smoked or sometimes caught alive, also went to restaurants in anywhere from Hanoi and Da Nang up into Guangzhou and into other cities of China. Economic prosperity in East Asia means many millions more people today than ever before can afford to buy exotic foods and remedies. And so the wildlife trade is booming with the result that many, many forests really throughout Southeast Asia, but also in Africa and even to some degree in South America are becoming empty forests. As one biologist friend put it, these are forests where you can't find an animal larger than a cocker spaniel. They're just being emptied. Now I hasten to add that the wildlife trade is only the most gruesome manifestation of humankind's war on the wild world. Population growth, industries of all kinds, including industrial agriculture, pollution, climate change, and much more. All these powerful forces are reducing wildlife's share of the pie chart of life to the tiniest sliver. And I'll say a word more about that down the line. But I don't mean by what I've said so far to identify our Asian brothers and sisters as the guilty parties. We are all implicated in this, in the industrial world in which we live. At any rate, this expedition led to another book. And that's the second book of the trilogy. And it concerns the Saula and the wildlife trade, but even more, it's an adventure story of our expedition in the forest of Lao PDR. And one of its main theme is that it exalts the beauty of the tropical forest. But when I finished that book, I hit a wall. 
I was heartsick. I was depressed. I was increasingly numbed out. One image in particular lingered for me. This is a red shanked duke, perhaps the world's handsomest monkey, dangling upside down from its snare pole, its fur still soft and luminous, the earth only inches past the reach of its delicate hands. I felt haunted by this animal's slow death from dehydration and despair. All of that is background. Now I'm getting to the real business of what I want to talk about, which is how to deal with this state, this state of being bummed out about the natural world and the future that we have created for it. I was not long back from Laos and Vietnam when something happened for me at Canyon de Chelles. I was there for another book project, not related to this trilogy. I was up on the rim of the canyon looking down into in there and it was October, you know, as you know, such a glorious time of year and we're so lucky to live in this part of the world. I mean, the cottonwoods, the aspen, the blue sky, and it was one of those days. And what a splendid, splendid day it was. And off to the side from the rim, I saw this. A white horse partway up a dune at the bottom of a cliff. The dune was corrugated with sheep trails. Thorny, inedible green shrubs stippled the sand. I couldn't imagine what that poor horse was finding to eat. The land was battered, almost barren, and yet I could not take my eyes from the view. A bright white horse amid emerald shrubs on purple red sand. The color, the contrast, the unadorned solitude of the horse, all the elements of the tableau converged in a way that was more than pretty, more than merely picturesque. I felt stunned and then inspired, although I could not immediately say how. I snapped a dozen photographs, sensing that the horse and the land on which it grazed answered a question I had not known how to ask. Much later, I realized the photographs expressed something I had failed to grasp in the Lao forests. The realization was almost mathematical. It said that Earth's beauty is inexhaustible. Even where the world is most diminished, beauty remains. The forces that erode the life of the planet can reduce but not eliminate that beauty, for beauty is intrinsic to this planet. Or if not to the planet, then to the way we sapiens have evolved to see it. And the beauty belongs to us. It inheres also in us. And it needs to be conserved in us too, for we are part of the planet. That wasn't all. Think about it. <coughs> if beauty is infinite, then the need, and for some of us, the obligation to defend such beauty is also infinite. This obligation will last as long as beauty lasts, and so it will have no end. And that kind of work serving that duty, that work can be meaningful, I thought. And meaning in life is something we all hunger for. I thought I was onto something, a piece of the puzzle I was trying to solve, or at least a fragment of a piece, but it was just a start. Uh oh. It doesn't want me to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Thank you, Bronis. Then in 2016, 
I was invited to join a medical expedition bound for one of the remotest regions of Nepal, a place called Upper Dolpo, which some of you may have heard of or read about because it's the locus of Peter Matheson's nonfiction classic, The Snow Leopard. We were walking the same trails that Matheson and George Schaller walked back in 1973. The expedition's purpose was to deliver primary health care to people who rarely or never see a clinician. We were both a medical expedition. Oh, what, let, sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, we were the nomads clinic. Let's see if this will work. There we go. We were the nomads clinic, a project of the Upaya Zen Center of Santa Fe. And we included doctors, nurses, Buddhist clerics, supernumeraries like me, and a large staff of guides, muleteers, and camp tenders. We were both a medical expedition and a pilgrimage bound for many holy places. But I was a slow and stubborn learner, and I resisted the idea of pilgrimage. I resisted the idea that I was a pilgrim. To heck with that, I thought. I was a hard-boiled, dry-eyed environmental journalist and book writer. I was going on this 150-mile trek over five 17,000-foot mountain passes in the high, cold desert between the Himalayan crest and the Tibetan plateau just to see the country and to work on an idea. The idea was this. Might it be time for people who care about Earth to begin thinking of themselves as hospice workers. Might the ethics and values of hospice lead to a kind of earth care that was more effective and also kinder to its practitioners than the relentless striving to fix things that I was accustomed to? I don't want to dwell on this except to say that I was intrigued by two medical fi findings. First, that patients who go into hospice, hospice tend to live at least as long and often longer than patients in comparable health who submit to drastic interventions. As Atul Gawande puts it in a brilliant book called Being Mortal, the lesson seems almost Zen. You live longer only when you stop trying to live longer. Meanwhile, the quality of life enjoyed by hospice patients in their last months is incomparably superior. This is also true for their loved ones and caregivers, which is the second finding. While hospice nurses do not work less hard or with less dedication than their counterparts in intensive care units, they are three times less likely to suffer major depression. I'm not gonna go into the ramifications of this, that's in the book and I'll just leave that for now. But our clinic, would practice a kind of medicine that was similar to hospice and to its cousin, palliative care. We would have no access to x-rays, no access to scans, lab work, surgery, you name it. Our pharmacy was very limited. We couldn't do long-term drug therapies or really in most cases in, uh, schedule the most rudimentary follow-up visit. So we would have to prioritize care over cure. And like good hospice workers, we would have to focus on making the present moment as good as it could be. And we would have to recognize the limits of our powers and not become attached to specific outcomes. Let me just quickly say that applying the concept of hospice to earth care is an exercise in metaphor. And the metaphor is imperfect. Earth is not dying. Irrespective of the damage we sapiens accomplish, life will continue on this planet as it has for billions of years. It will continue for billions of years more. What's dying is the wild part of the creation of which we are a part. 
which measured in terms of carbon mass, if you will, is down to less than 3%, probably now closer to 2% of the total mammalian carbon mass on planet Earth. That's all, that 2% is all that the elephants and the squirrels and the tigers and the bears and the coyotes get. Everything else is humans and their livestock. It's amazing. We're heading down toward just a little blip, flatlining the share that wildlife get of the bounty of the planet. But back to the expedition. It took me six weeks on the trail in 2016 and five more weeks on a return expedition in 2018 to come to my senses. I had to go on the second expedition to understand what I'd experienced in the first one. Because on the first one, everything was so new, there was so much stimulation. I was about as smart as a dog watching television. I mean, I just didn't really get what I was seeing. And I had to go back a second time to let things sink in. And one of the things that, sink, that sank in was the realization, finally, that I was a pilgrim, that life is or should be a pilgrimage. Attaining that realization is what allowed me to complete the third book of my accidental trilogy, uh, which is this one. Um, right now, I'm going to pause and give you a taste of the book because I've, I get tired hearing myself talk about doom and gloomish kinds of things, and I'm actually not that dark. So this is this this book is comprised of of. Uh, 61 very short episodes. And I'm just going to read you one. It's episode number 27 titled Yatra. And you'll learn what Yatra means in the course of this. The long climb up from Shimen, which Govinda took at a lope, is for me a metronomic trudge. Step upon step, breathing hard, I think only of the act of walking. With amusement, I realize that I am still learning to walk. I am learning, for instance, that I must walk slowly enough that I do not need to rest. At the right pace, my lungs and legs work in synchrony, and I neither gasp nor feel weak. If I stop longer, if I stop longer than a few seconds, I lose my rhythm. It's as though my lungs and legs leave their posts, go on break, and refuse to come back. And even when forced to resume their duties, they resist working together. The trick is to keep them at their jobs. Like the tortoise that raced the hare in Aesop's fable, I need to stay in motion. Old Aesop must have walked up many a mountain. I'm lightheaded near the top of the climb. My trailmates sprawl on rocks, their packs beside them. And here comes a family of villagers, mother, father, and young boy, headed down to Shimon. In Dalpo, upon encountering strangers, you bow slightly if your hands, and if your hands are free, you might bring them together in a gesture of prayer. And you say, namaste. It's a simple word, but profound in its depth. It roughly translates as, I bow to the divine in you. By contrast, our English hi and hello have no more meaning than marks of punctuation. Each member of the passing family says namaste to me. Namaste, I say back, and their bright smiles continue to shimmer in my mind's eye minutes after they're gone. I probably need to drink some water. <laughs> this morning, Tenzin spoke in our circle as usual, his delivery was staccato and epigrammatic, more poem than paragraph. Tenzin's gift is to mix the cosmic with the trivial. Stop. Take view into you, he coached. Absorb mountain. Eat later. 
more important than snack bar, than granola bar, is getting blessings from our journey. He paused, looking around the group to gauge his audience. Every day a yatra, he said, a yatra being a religious journey or pilgrimage. Oh, we have been through. You will feel this. You will feel lighter, I think. Such lightness, I imagine, would render one indifferent to whether the trail climbed or, fa or fell, whether the distance to go was long or short. Such lightness might even enable the resolute pilgrim to round a bend and say, namaste, and mean it to any other creature, be it saint, songbird, or snow leopard. On this day, alas, I cannot tell my lightness from my lightheadedness, but perhaps if I keep walking, eventually I might. So back to the expedition, and I'm just showing random slides at this point, just so you can get a sense of the geography we were in. Um, the issue I thought I was going to the farther side of the Himalaya to wrestle down, as I said, concerned the application of hospice ethics to earth care. And I'll tell you, nothing I learned or experienced contradicted that hypothesis. But mainly I came away with a list of slogans. Care over cure avoid attachment to specific outcomes, optimize the present, but also recognize and honor endings, strong back, soft front, by which I mean, you have to be ready for the hard stuff, but not by shutting out the people or other beings entangled in it. That was our watchword for the whole expedition, operate with a strong back and a soft front. You can get an idea of what it means by reversing it. A strong front and a soft back means you're always bluffing. You're always worried about criticism. You're not in sync with yourself. Believe it or not, we've had politicians like that. <laughs> Those slogans were good. They helped me. But contrary to my expectation, the real breakthrough turned out to be something else, something less in the mind and more in the heart. I needed to make peace. Oh, that's one of our doctors, Wendy Lau who used to be an emergency room doc in, uh, in Brooklyn. I needed to make peace with sorrow. My delight in the beauty of the natural world coexisted with grief at its destruction. These emotions were like cellmates who cannot get along. They dwelled in my head and my heart and their constant argument created a moral ache. I had to either dispel that ache or learn to live with it. Dealing with that sorrow became the real business of my travel in the Himalaya. And part of what I had to do was to rekindle a sense of hope, but not a simple kind of hope. I had to find my way now that I had lost it. I had to reconnect to Earth's beauty, not as adornment, but as nourishment. I also had to revise my understanding of science, focusing not on the science of power and control, but on the science that swings open the gates of wonder. In the end, I found what I was looking for and the credit goes to my teachers, my companions, the medicos, our guides and crew, the Buddhist priests, the Nepali and American participants at every level of the expedition, and our hosts, 
the villagers of Dolpho, who were also our patients and whose cheerful stoicism was profoundly inspiring. And another teacher was the land itself, the indescribably beautiful expanses of the Himalaya, a little of whose spaciousness I prayed might seep into me if I was lucky. Thanks to those teachers, I got answers to my questions, but I can only partly tell you what they were. And this is not a cheesy spoiler alert. I really mean it. The lessons don't fit into sound bites. They work their way into you deeply. You have to take the journey to get them into you. I hope the book shares the journey so you can take it. But nevertheless, I'm going to try to summarize them in just a sec. How much, where are we in time right now? 35. At 35? Um, I don't know whether to read another passage or to carry on. I read it, read it. Read, all right. <laughs> um, this is a passage called Rena. It's one that I enjoyed writing perhaps as much or more than anything else in the book. A thin line miles away scars the breast of a mountain, as though long ago a blade had sliced the land. Pixels of red, yellow, and black stipple the line, and if you look away and then look back, you see that the pixels have moved. They are people in smudged jackets walking a trail, also yaks bearing grain and lumber, and horses and mules. They are dolpo afoot, Dolpo in the distance, Dolpo clinging to its ver vertical world. Above the trail, the top of the mountain is lost in clouds. Below, its base lies beyond the reach of the sun. In an hour, maybe two, our train of walkers and mules will reach the mountainside where the pixels inch along. We will follow the scalpel-cut trail to a river foaming down from a pass. Across the river sprawls a village. The windows of the houses squint darkly at fields, livestock pens, and low rock walls. The roofs, like the slopes behind the village, quiver with prayer flags. Smoke funnels from the rooftops, and the wind snatches it away. We arrive. A boy with a stick chases a hoop down a lane. Three girls in sooty rags lean together in conference. Suddenly they turn gap-toothed, eyes bright. Namaste, they sing in piccolo voices. We camp at this village, which is every village, Ringmo, Tokyu, Tinje, Shimon, Koman, Saldang, and more. We are eyed cautiously, then merrily. After a clinic comes the cultural performance, a thank you for the ibuprofen and amoxicillin, the acupuncture and the clean feet the earnest listening of interpreters and medicos with stethoscopes around their necks. A man comes forward with a dranyan, which is a Tibetan lute. Six women form a line and chant to its drone, their voices like a chorus of sparrows. They dance in minute, precise step. They repeat a step three times, then shuffle. The next step mirrors the first, but begins with the other foot. We try to copy the movements, but it looks easy, but none of us can do it. A fugitive half beat or quarter step is always lacking. The dance is like culture. You have to learn it from the inside. <coughs> the songs wear on. Each starts like a dirge, but ends at a gallop. We stand in the dark darkening cold. After two songs, we think more about our sleeping bags than we do about the music. After three, we say, thank you so much. One more song and we will bid you good night. But no, we are told, that would be unwise. To do one more would make the total four, and four of anything is unlucky. Five is no better. There must be six. Well, of course, thank you. We are tired, but it is all right. We stand in a cold shower of starlight as the Dranyan and the sparrows sing on. Later in my tent, I cannot sleep. I switch on a headlamp 
and rummage in my duffel. I have brought a packet of clippings, items collected in advance of the trip and stored against a night like this one. I have read the packet through more than once, the review of a novel by a writer I admire, an essay on the language of animals, and, oh, what's this? I unfold a wad of newsprint to discover a eulogy for a Pueblo Indian scholar who has died. Her name is Rena Swensel. I knew her so slightly. She was modest and learned, and she possessed a voice so soft it drew you to the edge of your chair. When I once heard Jane Goodall speak, I thought of Rena. They were cast from the same mold, strong, brilliant women. Rena was Tewa from Santa Clara Pueblo. In many a presentation, usually before small groups, she would tell her listeners about Powaha, the water wind breath that flows through trees, rocks, people, and all things. The Tewa say it is the force that animates the world. In Rena's description, it sounded like the Tao of ancient China, or at least its cousin. She said, many of our problems arise when we forget that we share powaha with the rest of creation. The invention of anthropomorphic gods flattered us to think we were godlike. Our narcissism misled us into, quote, making the world smaller and smaller until it is nothing but us. I read again the words I underlined in the clipping, just human beings out of our natural context, out of our cosmological context. We have become so small in our view of the world, our world is simply us, human beings. I put away the clipping and extinguished the headlamp. The silence of the night deepens. Some de distance away, a sleeper snores. From farther down the hill comes the cheery singing of a tent full of guides and kitchen staff who seem never to tire and rarely to sleep. Periodically, too, I hear the oohs and ahs of a group of round eyes, Westerners like us, a group of round eyes who have stayed up to watch for meteors. Drowsy now, I wonder what kind of water wind breath reaches that far into the heavens and flows in the light of the stars. Okay, back to those takeaways. I try to summarize them in the final lines of the book. Every day, a yatra. Every situation, a clinic. Absorb the beauty. Build an arc. Be alive. I can unpack those 16 words for you a little bit, but really to grasp them in full, you have to take the journey. Every day a yatra, as I mentioned earlier, yatra means pilgrimage. On a pilgrimage, you can't go missing. You have to show up and be present, and you have to be clear about your intentions especially in rough country and our daily lives at Western Colorado University or on the streets of Los Angeles or in Santa Fe or any place from the wilderness to Brooklyn can be rough country. We are always in rough country learning how to walk. I have come to take that concept very seriously. And at the age of 72, I realize I still have a lot to learn about how to walk. Every situation, a clinic. I so admired the clinicians I worked with. Their approach to each new patient, whether the case was simple or complex, whether joyful or gruesome, was an inspiration to me. Strong back, soft front, you betcha. But that's just the beginning. When the caca starts hitting the fan, I try to imagine myself as a medic in a clinic, stepping up to the next challenging case. 
absorb the beauty. Yes, it is nourishment. You have to make time for it, create space for it, and seek it out in the most unlikely places. Build an ark. We return to the domain of metaphor. The diminishment of the natural world behooves us to become latter-day Noahs. We need to build arcs, vehicles to carry the beauty and diversity of Earth's present creation across the inhospitable seas that lie ahead. Many of you have already been at this work for a long time. Many others of you are training yourselves so that you can participate in this very important, very meaningful work. The work can take many forms, building arcs in the form of parks, wildlife refuges, reserved forests, wildlife corridors, restricted use zones. The potential designs are legion. Same thing for building soil, for finding alternatives to destructive practices in land use, agriculture, and ranching, for restoring balance to abused ecosystems. The possibilities are truly endless. Old leaky arcs, like many of our national parks and other public lands, need an overhaul to become seaworthy. And even then, the voyage is sure to be rough. The imperative is to launch as many arcs as possible. Some will sink, some will be blown off course, and not all the rest will get through with their cargoes intact. But if we prepare, not for the worst, but for the best, some of our arcs will complete their voyage to better days. The more we build, the more we'll make it. So we need to build away like good hospice workers without worrying too much about outcomes and things we cannot control. And the last of the five lines, be alive, which is to say, be in love with life yours and the lives of those around you and the lives of the creatures around you and the existence of this world. I want to add that being fully alive means being also hopeful, but being hopeful in the deepest sense is not a simple business. So I would like to close by reading yet another episode. It's also short, short as the other ones, just a little bit more than a page, which is titled simply, Hope. That's a Dranian. Hope means different things to different people. In its simplest form, it expresses a desire for things to turn out well, for a worrying story to have a happy ending. Most of the time when people ask about hope, they're asking, will everything be all right? Can we return to how things used to be when this worry didn't exist? With regard to climate change, the answer is no. Too much CO2 and other heat trapping gases are already burdening the planet's atmosphere and oceans. The effects will be with us for at least several lifetimes. We cannot draw a get, a, get out of jail free card for none exists. But hope has other meanings. Vaclav Havel wrote, Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. Havel was linking hope to the philosophical distinction between instrumental good and intrinsic good. Something is instrumentally good if it produces a desired result. Its goodness depends on outcome. 
but a thing is intrinsically good if doing it is virtual, virtuous of and by itself. That is, if its, its value exists independently of results. The essence of hope, Havel was saying, is to believe in the intrinsic goodness of right action. Through his many years as an outcast or in prison, fighting the Soviet domination of Czechoslovakia, Havel never knew until the Soviet Union's final collapse if his efforts would succeed. Yet he persisted in a spirit of hope, knowing his course was correct. The novelist Barbara Kingsolver also distinguishes between hope and optimism. In her view, and I'm quoting her, the pessimist would say, it's going to be a terrible winter, we're all gonna die. <laughs> the optimist would say, oh, it'll be all right. I don't think it'll be that bad. The hopeful person would say, maybe someone will still be alive in February, so I'm going to put some potatoes in the root cellar just in case. <laughs> King Solver concludes, hope is a mode of survival. I think hope is a mode of resistance. The hope she describes is close to the ecological notion of surprise, that sometimes big consequential things happen with virtually no warning. An earthquake or the fall of the Soviet Union being good examples. To trust in the uncertainty of the future, believing in the possibility, however remote, of beneficial change, this is the essence of hope. Of course, surprise is no panacea. It can harm as well as benefit a new coronavirus triggering a pandemic being a salient case in point. Surprise comes to us out of the vastness of what we don't know. It is amoral and uncaring, but it is also central to true hopefulness. Roshi Joan, that's Joan Halifax, who was the abbot of Upaya Zen Center and the leader of our expedition. Roshi Joan puts surprise and uncertainty at the center of her teaching. Placing trust in not knowing, she says, offers a strategy for dealing with dark times. Change is certain, and there is always a chance things will improve. Here is where King Solver's wisdom connects with Havel's. King Solver is talking about future surprise, the uncertainty of how the winter that lies ahead will turn out. Havel is talking about how we carry ourselves in the meantime. We have to do what makes sense, irrespective of outcome. In jail, Havel could not know if the Soviet Union would crumble during his lifetime. Nor could Nelson Mandela, during 33 years of imprisonment, know when apartheid might similarly disintegrate. But when the long desired surprise arrived, both men, having done what makes sense, seized the, mo the moment and helped render the surprise as beneficial as possible. The essence of their preparation was that they never lost hope. Neither should we. Thank you very much. for a couple of questions? Sure. Yes, we have over 10 minutes. Oh, great. Um, happy to respond to any questions anybody might have, including people who are not here, who might be listening in on Zoom, who can put a question in the chat if you're so moved to, to do so. Don't everybody raise your hand at once. <laughs> we got someone there? Was there 
like one experience or interaction with a patient that you had on your medical expedition that really stood out to you? Uh, I'm going to repeat the question so that people listening on Zoom can hear it. I really appreciate that question. The question is whether there was one uh, interaction with a patient that uh, really stood out, that really was moving. And um, actually, there were quite a few, but there was one in particular that um, was mind blowing for pretty much everybody in the clinic. Uh, we were in a village where a man came in, a young man, probably in, around 20 years old, came in and he was paralyzed to such a degree that one leg just stuck out way out there and he kind of scrabbled along using his hands and his other leg almost horizontally along the ground. And he came with his mother uh, to see if we could help him. And we had a terrific neurologist on, in the clinic and, and he examined this young man and determined with the history that the mother gave him that as a neonate, as a newborn, this boy had suffered a, a, a stroke and that had frozen him in this position. One of our Sherpas had sat with the boy for a while. I talked to her afterwards. She's, she's, she was not a sentimentalist. This is a woman, one of the three greatest women climbers in Nepal. She had summited K2 Everest several times. She's tough person. She said, this boy, there was so much beauty in his eyes. We usually see real hardship at a distance. And we, I try to keep a distance from it because I'm almost afraid that it'll like infect me. Well, this, this fellow was a beautiful person. And our neurologist, Michael Lobatz, determined that, you know, with Botox on the frozen muscles, maybe he could get some flexibility again. And with physical therapy and, and other kinds of therapies, he could probably stand up and learn to walk again. And so he and other medicos and Roshi Joan reviewed all this with his mother and they discussed it. And then they gave us their answer, no thanks, no thanks. Those two people loved their life together and they knew that if the boy somehow could be transported to Kathmandu for the kinds of therapies that were in store, that the balance of their lives together would be upset. And the boy well knew that his mother, who was getting on in years, wasn't going to be alive that much longer. And that after she died, he would die too, because she couldn't survive without her caring for him. But he and she cherished the life they had to such a degree they didn't, and, it, and they weren't fearful people. They, they balanced it. They knew what they were doing and they opted for their present life to continue. We talked about that a lot when our expedition was in circle and I can tell you there were a lot of tears that fell that afternoon, very moving. Yeah. Um, all do, your time you spent on the trip. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. For two people? I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead in the back. We'll do both. All your time spent on the trail. What was your go to like snack? <laughs> <laughs> My go to snack. <laughs> What's in your trail mix? <laughs> Gosh, I don't know. We were actually well fed on the trail. I know I had some stuff, but. Oh. Uh, I'll tell you, the, the most fun snack was yak cheese. <laughs> yak cheese. It's the, like the, it, it's a way of preserving protein that produces a cheese about as hard as a pebble. <laughs> and the first time I had it, Tenzin handed it to me. Tenzin was the head outfitter. He was in charge of the 
logistics and stuff. He said, put in mouth, leave there after a while, tasty. <laughs> Very good description of yak cheese. <laughs> Yeah. So has the accidental trilogy led you to a precipice of another question or something that you may fall into next? I mean, what I know you, I'm just wondering what's next. Is there something next? Is there not? Is there you know that's a, next? that's a great question which I cannot answer. That's a great uh, answer. Right now I'm still sort of in the in the aftermath of the book, I'm still living inside the book as I talk about it and, and so forth. I've got a number of projects that are just kind of marinating. And, you know, I feel as though the learning that I experienced in the course of not just the expeditions, but then the learning really deepened when I tried to write about the expedition. I mean, for me as a writer, the act of writing is how I process the world. And I don't know what I think I know until I've written it. And so the, what I learned from writing the book is also still marinating with me. So I, 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 you know, I'd love to be able to look forward and tell you where everything in my alleged mind is headed, but I have the foggiest notion. You know. Thank you. <laughs> Bill, we're gonna turn to some questions online. Oh, okay. Here's one. Do you have any suggestions about how to inspire this sense of pilgrimage within the context of modern Western Eurocentric communities without the travel so that the ethos becomes relevant now and how to carry grief and show up? Hmm. You know, I've spent all this time with uh, Buddhists and I don't consider myself a Buddhist, and I don't have a daily meditation practice, which a good Buddhist would have. But one thing I do is walk. One of the uh, epigraphs for the book is from Bruce Chatwin, which is, my God is the God of walkers. If you walk far enough, you probably don't need any other God. <laughs> and I was joking with Micah and Derek, wherever Derek is, uh, earlier this afternoon, we went down to the river and I was joking that you should bring classes here and train them in walking meditation. It's not really a joke. I really mean that. For me, that's how I find out where I am through walking meditation. And it's a miracle. I don't think anybody really understands how it works, but it works that the problems we think about often get solved while we're walking. I know everybody in this room has had the experience of some idea or, or solution to a puzzle in, my, in your life bubbling up into the conscious mind while you're walking. So I think that's one way right. to arm yourself, to prepare yourself, to keep yourself rooted and centered in a way that allows you then to carry the grief. And the, the final denouement of the book is about something that happened to me while I was walking. This this phrase came into my mind completely unbidden, which was the right way to carry the grief is the right way to walk. The right way to carry, I was walking along and, it, and the phrase had the rhythm of a march and I marched to it and then I turned it around. The right way to walk is the right way to carry the grief. And that became a kind of koan something that I meditated on. And that's sort of my return to point when I try to deal with the grief, to focus on, okay, you're grieving. The way you deal with that, work on your walking. And walking, of course, is perhaps the most metaphor-laden term in our language. Walking 
is living. Walking is how you progress through space and through time. So in that nutshell, that's where I draw my strength, such as it is. Shall we wrap, do we need to wrap it up? Thank you all so much. It's really been a pleasure talking to you. You in this room, anyone in that room, all of you who are out there on Zoom, thank you and namaste. Thank you.